Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Grove. I'm going to go ahead and stand together. We're going to sing and worship the Lord. Celebrate His amazing grace. Let's sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty, so much stronger? Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. And you can go ahead and find your seat. Finish saying hello. There you go. <laughs> Grab a seat. I do want to do want to welcome you here again to the Grove. We're glad that you're, you've chosen to spend part of your Sunday here with us worshiping the Lord. Uh, I want to take just a moment and uh, remind you of a couple things. Uh, you may have heard this from me before, but if you're new here, you probably have it. So first of all, there's a couple things in the seat backs in front of you. One of those is a connection card. 
If you want, you can go ahead and grab that and begin filling it out. We'd love for everyone to fill one of those out, especially for our regular uh, attenders, our members. So go ahead and do that. Uh, and if, you are, if you're not one of our regular attenders or members, then uh, I, we would love for you to fill one of those out and share as much information as you're comfortable with. On the front, you can put your name and an email address. And then you can flip it over. On the back, there's some next steps that you can indicate. You might be interested in taking some of those, as well as spots for you to let us know about any comments or questions you may have. Uh, about your time here today, as well as any prayer requests, ways that we can pray for you. We'd love to, to hear about that and know how we can uh, pray for you. That's a great way to begin connecting here at The Grove. Uh, second thing in that uh, little pocket on the seat in front of you is a giving envelope. That's a way that you can help contribute to The Grove, uh, contribute to helping move the mission of The Grove forward financially. Um, if you're interested in doing that, you can fill it out and then drop it along with your connection card at the, uh, at the back in the offering box there. Also on the way in, hopefully you grabbed a program. There's some more uh, right back there on that table by the offering box if you didn't get one. Inside there, you can find out a lot about what's going on here at the Grove, uh, as well as there's a, a note sheet that will let you follow along with the message when Pastor Christian comes in just a little bit. So uh, with that said, I want to invite you to go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read our call to worship, which comes uh, today comes from Amos chapter 4, verse 13. And it says, He is here. The one who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man. The one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. We worship a mighty God. He has revealed himself as Father. Let's worship him today. Let's sing. Good. 
Lord, Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. so much for the opportunity to worship today, to come before you. Will you meet us here in this place? Will you open our hearts and minds and speak to us through Pastor Christian as he comes? We pray for your help today. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Isn't there anything we can do to help Thomas? They're attacking to the witch's house. And you know what they say? There's few that go through them gates that come out again. Fish and chips. <laughs> but there, there's hope, dear. What's a hope? <coughs> oh, yeah, there's a right bit more than hope. <laughs> you cheeky little blighter. <laughs> what? You don't know, do you? Well, we haven't exactly been here very long. Well, he's only the king of the whole wood. The top geezer. The real king of Narnia. He's been away for a long while. But he's just got back. And he's waiting for you near the stone table. He's waiting for us. You're blooming joking. They don't even know about the prophecy. Well, then... Look. Aslan's return. Thomas' arrest. The secret police. It's all happening because of you. You're blaming us? No. Not blaming. Thanking you. There's a prophecy. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. You know, that doesn't really work. Yeah, I know it doesn't, but you're kind of missing the point. It has long been foretold that two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve will defeat the White Witch and restore peace to Narnia. And do you think we're the ones? Well, you better be, because Aslan's already fitted out your army. Our army? Mum sent us away so we wouldn't get caught up in a war. I think you've made a mistake. We're not heroes. We're from Finchley. 
thank you for your hospitality. But we really have to go. You can't just leave. He's right. We have to help Mr. Thomas. It's out of our hands. I'm sorry. It's time the four of us were getting home. I want to welcome you again. My name is Christian. If we haven't met, I'm the lead pastor here in the Grove. And uh, if you're not familiar, and that's okay if you're not, but this is a, a clip from the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the first book in a uh, classic series by C.S. Lewis. And just a little background of what you just saw in case you're kind of like, what is going on? Um, so you have four children, the Pevensey children, who go to visit their uncle uh, in World War II era London, and they walk into a wardrobe, and on the other side of that wardrobe uh, is a magical land called Narnia. And when they get into Narnia, they meet a fawn named Mr. Tumnus, who shortly after is kidnapped by someone known as the White Witch. And as they try to figure out how to help their friend, they come across Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, who, again, as you saw, begin to fill them in on the promise, the prophecy that had been written long ago, and, and they get to, to hear a little bit about this person, this creature, Aslan. And you say, well, why are we showing that this morning? And, and it'll become more clear, I think, as we go on, but, but a couple things stand out. One is that just in that little, uh, that little clip, you get uh, some, some confusion. There, there's this confusion about uh, uncertainty over the nature of the king. Who, who is this king that we're talking about? So there's this uncertainty over that. And then you also see these unlikely representatives of the king. Right? Unlikely in that they don't even know who the king is. And yet now they're finding out that they're there to represent him, to, to help bring about something really important, something that is warlike, according to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And, and so what we're going to look at today as we continue in this series is something that turns on uh, something very similar. In this series, Minor Prophets, Major Mission, we've been looking at these prophets who are minor only in the length of their writing, but are used by God to answer these big eternal questions. And we have them. We just sang about that. We have, we have questions. And, and God uses these prophets, uses their lives, uses their message to help bring about answers to these key questions. And so today what we're going to do is turn to the prophet Amos. Famous Amos, okay, if you like chocolate chip cookies, and that means something to you. But we're going to turn to Amos, who addresses this question, does God care? Okay. Does God care? And what we find in answer to that question is this. Amos is going to issue to us a warning. He warns us, but he also welcomes us. As we get into this book, you'll see he warns us and he welcomes us, and here's the message of that warning and welcome. God roars. The warning and the welcome is found in the fact that God roars. I want you to hear the very beginning of Amos' writing. It says, The words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, what he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, the Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. What we find here again is Amos wants us to know that God roars. I was doing some research on lions' roars this week. And this is what I found out. In general, of all the wild cats, lions have the loudest roars. If you were one meter away Okay, just one meter away from a lion, which is not a spot that I recommend unless there's like large bars in between you and that lion. Uh, that lion's roar can reach up to 114 decibels, which is louder than a music concert, which is about 110 decibels. Almost as loud as a jet plane taking off, 120 decibels. And it's about 25 times louder than a gas-powered lawnmower. This is loud. In fact, a lion's roar can be heard up to five miles away. Now, I mentioned that what Amos wants us to see is that God roars, and he roars in warning and welcome. And, and the same can be said in a certain way about a lion's roar. Lions roar mostly to warn intruders to stay away. So most of the time, if you hear a lion roar, it's because somebody is approaching them 
in a way that they shouldn't. They're encroaching upon them in some form or fashion, and the, war, the roar is a warning. Hey, you don't know what you're in for. You need to stay away. But at the same time, lions also roar in a way of welcome. Both male and female lions will roar to show health and strength to their pride members. And most often, they use their roaring to welcome, to, to communicate their location with other pride members. It's a greeting in a certain way. It's meant to help them communicate with one another, know where they are, and keep each other aware of what's going on. And so with that in mind, I want to just, before we get into it too much farther, I want to give you a little background on Amos as we've been doing for each of these letters. So here's some Amos basics, and, and as we, before I look at that, I want you to hear one more uh, just little statement that Amos makes. It's a little bit more biogra- autobiographical about himself. He gives us a little bit more information about himself in an encounter he has with the, the king of Israel. Chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Amos answered Amaziah, I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman, and I took care of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. So with that in mind, I want you to realize, right, I said that watching the Pevensey children, these unlikely representatives of the king, here we find Amos as well is a bit of an unlikely representative of God. What what we'll find as we look at these basics, first off, Amos' name means burden bearer. He has been called to bear the burden of Israel's sin. Now, what's interesting about that um, is that he's actually from, not from Israel, and we'll get to that in a second. But what we know about Amos is he was the first of the writing prophets. So as you're kind of looking at a timeline here, he's among the very first of the minor prophets to write his, his work here. And, and by writing prophet, what we mean is he's different than Elijah or Elisha, known, well-known prophets of the Old Testament, and yet they weren't responsible for writing their prophecies. Their, their work was recorded by others, but here we have a different kind of prophet. This is the writing prophets. And so we uh, believe that Amos wrote, based on what he tells us in, chapter, in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, in terms of the kings that were alive at the time and, and even this earthquake that is very notable for the time, that Amos probably wrote somewhere around 760 B.C., okay, about 760 years before Christ. And what we know about him, again, he was an unlikely representative of God, is that he's a sheep herder. Okay? He probably was a pretty well-to-do sheep herder. I mean, maybe not super rich, but, but doing well for himself. He was a cattleman, and he was a dresser, it, we're told, a, a dresser or, or a farmer of sycamore figs. Now, maybe he grew those sycamore figs. Maybe more likely is he performed a, a specific act upon the, the sycamore figs. They, they had to be sort of dressed. They had to be crushed in a certain way, and that's what, what allowed for them to be used in however they were going to be used. But So here we, we find this guy. He's an ag guy. He's, he's there just farming and ranching and, and taking care of the things of the earth. And God says, I've got something else for you. I know you've been working, you've been building your life over here, but I've got something else for you to do. And he calls him to be a prophet. And what's interesting is he, he calls him, he's from Judah, he's from Tekoa, he's down in the southern kingdom, but he's called to go address the, pe- the people, and specifically the king of Israel. You will recall back earlier, there was a split among God's people. It, it stemmed from uh, Solomon and his foolishness. He was the wisest man who ever lived in some respects, but but then he, he turned foolish, and, and even going back farther to his father David, there's this split that, that erupts among God's people. So you've got Israel in the north, you've got Judah in the south. And so here comes Amos from the south into the northern kingdom. And he's called there to address the issues of injustice in this pro- prosperous northern kingdom. What had been going on at the time is that these kings that are mentioned had actually done a really good job of making Israel prosperous. This was a time where there was relatively few uh, military enemies. Assyria was weak. It's not like it was, it's, a, it's going to be, where it comes and becomes this massive empire. And so Israel's doing pretty good. And, and specifically, they're, they're prospering financially. And because of that, they get some ideas about how they can operate that are completely opposite of what God intended for them. And so God raises up this farmer 
this rancher, and says, you're going to go into this northern kingdom to a people that you're not really, I mean, you're part of in a large respect, but, but they're not even your direct people, and you're going to go tell them what I have for them. And so that's what he does. And as he does this, then, he begins answering this question, does God care? And here's the first thing Amos makes very clear, is that God is certainly paying attention. I want us to remember and and understand that God is certainly paying attention. You ask that question, does God care? Well, it starts with, is he paying any attention? Now, he says later in his book, Amos 9.8, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. But what we find in the first part of this book, in, in chapters really one through six, is that what Amos is going to do is begin to circle around the surrounding nations. Okay, I want you to see, here, here's a picture of what goes on. These are the, the nations that are mentioned in the first two chapters. This is a, a picture from a, a, from a Bible project video and a, a, something they do. Um, but what you'll see is that he, he mentions a number of these nations. But he's circling around those nations, eventually getting to the bullseye of this target. At the center of that bullseye is Israel. Judah, his, his land is not immune from what God has seen. He's seen some things there. But at the center of this bullseye is Israel. And so he, he's letting them know, look, I'm seeing what's going on. This known world, I'm paying attention to what's going on in the nations. But at the center of, what my, of my grievance, God says through Amos, is you, Israel. God's paying attention. And what we find as you, you get into sort of the end of, of this first section, 1 through 6, is that the accusations that God has for his people boil down to this. And they're, they're kind of explained in terms of three woes. The first one has to do with injustice. Ver, chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, God says this. They hate, he's talking about the people, they hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate. And they despise the one who speaks with integrity. You trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him. What he's saying is, there are some people among you trying to do what's right, but you as a people globally, you, you mock that person who's trying to do what's good, who, who's trying to have integrity. Maybe you've been there, right? You're, the one, you're trying to stand for good, but all around you are people just mocking you. Just making out, oh, you're just a goody two-shoes, you're just sucking up. You know, whatever the, the way that we talk about this, when people set out to do good, but there's this indictment. Wait, wait, wait. Somebody's trying to do what's right, and you are casting them off. Not only that, but you trample on the poor. You exact a grain tax from him. You're just, you're just milking them for whatever you can get. People who need your help, and you're doing everything to, to exploit them, to profit off of them. And so God indicts them for this injustice. You trample on the poor. He also indicts them for their hypocrisy. Chapter 5, verse 21 He says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Yeah. Now, this is, this is, I don't know what that is. But this, okay, what this is, is God, I mean, this is, this is, in a certain way, I I don't want to say scary, because it doesn't need to be scary, but it, it, it is sobering. Oh, that we would never do things in our gathering as a people where God would say, look, I can't stand it when you get together. But this is what happens sometimes when when God's people have missed the boat. They get together and and the, the result of their getting together is nothing that honors him. Nothing that points people to him. And that's what he's indicting them for. Look. It's not good. You have this hypocrisy. You think because you're my people that you can just do whatever you want. And your religion then is stinky. It's a stench to God. The third thing he says is he's, he's accusing them of arrogance. Chapter six, chapter 6, verse 1, and then into 13, he says, Woe to those of you who are at ease in Zion. You who rejoice over Lodabar and say, Didn't we capture Karnaim for ourselves by our own strength? He says, you're at ease. You, you think you just kind of got it made? Like you just, you, you should be, and you think you should be. 
He says, you rejoice over Lodabar at Karnaim. These are two cities, probably northern part of Israel, that, that they most likely took over at some point. Like they, that became a part of Israel. He says, you, you rejoice over Lodabar. Lodabar's name means nothing. Essentially, the name means nothing. He says, you're rejoicing over nothing. You added nothing, and you're rejoicing over that. And, and Karnaim, I mean, this is a different kind of place. It's not nothing. But you think that you added Karnaim by your own strength. You're arrogant. You think all this stuff's happening because you just, you've got it figured out. You've got it together. You're not acknowledging my part in all of this. And again, woe to us if, if we get in our minds as God's people. Man, God's got better things to do because we've got it figured out. He needs to go help those other folks. We don't need him. He, he's free. We're going to free him up to go take care of other people who don't, who don't understand it like we do. If we're not careful, this is the kind of thing that shows up in churches. You start to think, oh, man, things are going good here. I can't imagine somebody would want to be a part of any other church. Man, this is where it's at. And that is, again, it's just a stench in God's nose. So he's accusing them of injustice, hypocrisy, and arrogance. This is what he says, what Amos tells us in chapter 3, verse 4, talking about God and in terms of what he's seen here. He says, does a lion roar? In the forest when it has no prey, does a young lion growl from its lair unless it has captured something? Now, I noted this as well. I found this out. Lions don't generally roar when hunting. I mean, you think about it. It kind of makes sense. If you're trying to stalk your prey, <laughs> roaring well, it might not help you in that endeavor. So they don't generally roar when hunting. But they do roar. What the point being made here is they do roar to communicate what's going on. Look, I've got something, and I'm letting the community know what's happened. And so it is God saying, I've seen what's going on, and I'm, going to, I'm roaring to you. Something needs to change. I've found you out. You're not hiding. I know what's going down. And so God roars. God is paying attention to what's happening on the earth. He's not blind. He's not unwilling to be bothered. And, and see, this is what's important. Is we ask the question, does God care? And we're usually thinking about, care about me. Does he care about me? Does he care about the things that have happened to me? We don't normally ask that question wondering, God, do you care about what I've done to others? God, do you, do you care? Because I, I was a jerk. Do you care? So usually we're asking the question because something's not going right in our own lives and we want to question, God, do you really care about me? We don't ask the question when things are going good. And we don't ask the question when we've done something wrong, usually. God's not blind. He's not unwilling to be bothered, but he's also not ambivalent. He's not just going to sit back and ignore this, which brings us to the second thing that Amos wants us to know is that God will not only, is certainly paying attention, but God will certainly deal with injustice. He is paying attention, but he will deal with injustice. Seven times in chapters one through two as he's indicting, as he's going around this, this target, he says, I will send fire. This is judgment. God's saying judgment is coming. Not only have I seen what you're doing, but judgment is coming. I will send fire upon you. And he says this in chapter 3, a little later, verse 8. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who will not prophesy? He says, who will not fear? What, what he's saying is this is a warning. There needs to be awareness that there is one not to be trifled with. God will certainly judge. He will deal with injustice. He will do what he's said he will do. Whether the prophets do their thing or not. Now, he's spoken. The prophets, are, their job is to say what God's actually said. But you had false prophets who know what God is, is saying, know what needs to be, be done, dealt with, and yet they're wanting to do a more palatable message, something that will make people feel good, something that won't sound quite so ominous. They want to be all about the welcome, but they, they miss the warning. God says, look. Justice is coming. And so he says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and you've got to hang with me here. This, is, this can be offensive. Listen to this message, you cows of Bashan, who are on the hill of Samaria, women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring us something to drink. Now, 
You say, wow, God, that's harsh, calling these women cows. Here's what's going on. It's not the way we crassly and rudely would use that term today. Bashan was pasture land. Pasture land known for healthy cattle, for plump cattle. And so it's an image that's meant to evoke, hey, look, you're getting fat and happy, but you're doing it based on your oppression of others. You're getting rich because others are suffering. And the point here is it's not just the men involved in the injustice and arrogance. This is pervasive. It's happening throughout this culture. They're all guilty. And he says the days are coming. It is certain. Okay, It says in verse 2, the Lord has sworn by his holiness, look, the days are coming when you will be taken away with hooks, every last one of you with fish hooks. And those days did indeed come because that Assyrian empire did come. And the Assyrians were known for being awful. And it is perhaps likely that they did drag people off as if like they were, they were fish. It was awful. But God says, look, I'm not going to ignore this injustice. It will be dealt with. And so he says later in, chapter 12, in verse 12, Therefore, Israel, this is what I will do to you. And since I will do that to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. He had just lined out what that judgment was going to look like. He says, this is what I will do. Prepare to meet your God. And then what we read this morning, both warning and welcome, he is here. The one who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man. The one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. And from here, we looked at 1 through 6, God's paying attention. Chapter 7 through 9 explains God's dealing with injustice. And it consists of five visions. The first three visions in chapter 7 through 9, are, Amos tells about visions that God gives him. One of locusts. And then two is of fire. And in each case, Amos appeals. He says, God, but man, I mean, really, is this what, what this requires? This kind of judgment, does it require that? And it says that God relents. But then the third one comes, a vision of a plumb line, meant to be a measurement. And it's God saying, look, I'm not throwing an arbitrary standard at my people. I'm holding them accountable to the standard that I've given them. And it's that standard that they violated. They've been measured and found wanting, is what he's saying. Now, but God relents for a time. He's patient. Then two more visions come. One is his overripe fruit. Summer fruit that, that's good and ripe, more ripe than you even want it to be. And the point is, the time has come. God has been patient, but there will be a time of reckoning. Sin will be dealt with. And we want sin dealt with in other people. But there's this assurance, sin will be dealt with. And the fifth vision is the Lord himself leading his army. We've talked about this in the weeks prior. Make no mistake, this is not God saying, eh, I don't really like what's going on here, but I guess we've got to do something about it. And so he's just, you know, some kind of, you know, hit job where he's like, oh, I'll just, I'll involve that. But I'm not going to, I have nothing to do with this. No, God's saying, no, I'm judging justly. I'm doing what is good here because sin is not to be allowed to continue to do its destructive work. And so God is leading the charge in dealing with the injustice. God is not to be trifled with. He is certainly paying attention. He will certainly deal with injustice. At the same time, we need to know that God has certain expectations for his people. He has certain expectations for his people. Going back to chapter 3, he says this, Listen to this message that the Lord has spoken against you, Israelites, against the entire clan that I brought from the land of Egypt. I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. What's happening here is Amos is invoking what took place back in Genesis chapter 12. There we hear this. 
from God to his people. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What he's saying is, I'm holding you accountable because I chose you to be my vessel of blessing to the nations, and instead, the nations have corrupted you, and you guys are all just doing the same thing. And you were content to be specially blessed. You were content to be my chosen people, but in your injustice and hypocrisy and arrogance, you've then expected me to treat you differently. Well, I will treat you differently. I will hold you more accountable because you have, again, violated the standard that I gave you. Instead of being a vessel of blessing, you are bringing curses upon yourselves. God has certain expectations for his people. And the expectations that they violated, the expectations that he continues to have for us, is that we will care for others. He expects that his people will care for others. So he tells them, chapter 5, verse 4, For the Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. So, yeah, we do seek you. Yeah, we seek you. Yeah, we seek you and all these other gods and just whatever else we decide might be helpful to our bottom line. God says, seek me and live. He says, well, what does that mean? Chapter 5, verse 14, pursue good and not evil so that you may live. And the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you've claimed. Does it mean to seek the Lord? It means to pursue good and not evil. That's where this living is found. And in chapter 5, verse 24, he's talking about how much their gatherings stink to him. He says, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Now, I know this topic of justice is crazy in our culture today. And it's abused and twisted and used to describe all kinds of things that really don't resemble justice. But if you think that because of whatever political stuff is going on, God says, yeah, that justice, thing, I know they're messing that up. Where, however you think it's, it's being messed up, I know it's being messed up, so just don't worry about that for a time. We missed it, folks. We don't get a pass. This is still the expectations of God. People, let justice flow. Let righteousness flow. Just last night, I, well, Sarah found a, an article. She was reading an article. It was an opinion article, but it, it's dealing with facts, and I'll, I'll have the article available for you to, to read if you get on a website this week. But the, the essence of the article was a new Holocaust. Maybe some of you have had the opportunity to go see the Holocaust exhibit here uh, in Union Station. I think it's still around for a few more months. But in this article... He's describing what's happening in China among the Uyghur Muslims. And this is what we're told. China has set up what might be the most extensive system of concentration camps in history. Evidence of the camps and their purpose is abundant. Authorities cite evidence for the existence of 1,200 camps above ground, holding 3 million prisoners. The camps are in Xinjiang province in western China, the home of 20 million Uyghur and Kazakh Muslims until vocational training camps were built in recent years. Now China says only 12.2 million Muslims are living in the province. Where did the other 7.8 million go? Beijing describes its treatment of the Uyghurs as the re-education of terrorists, but the alleged crimes really come down to being non-Chinese and Muslim. According to Satbe, who is a doctor who escaped China, is now living in Sweden and testifying to all the things that she, she had top secret access to, the things that she was witnessing there. Dr. Satbe, according to Satbe, Beijing teaches its Chinese citizens that Turkic peoples are an inferior race. And once inside the camps, these Uyghurs and Kazakhs are subjected to systematic torture, brainwashing, humiliation, and extermination. And the piece is not written as a, I mean, it's not written to be um, crassly shocking. 
But you read the article for yourself, and the details of what are going on there are horrendous and horrific. And here's the thing. You hear 7.8 million people have gone missing. 7.8, what do you do? I don't know, that's a big number, right? I mean, how do we even, you can't get your mind around that. It, it, it's another country. They, uh, yeah, they got stuff. And, and you know what? There's just so many things that are wrong all over the place. Why would I even, I can't even begin to, deal with this, right? I mean, that's where our minds start to go. Like, what do I I even do? How do I even begin to to deal with this? Well, here's what we do. As God's people, we pray for justice to be done. We we pray. We ask the Lord to, to expose evil. This is evil. It's unjust, and it doesn't matter whether they're Muslims or Christians or moon worshipers or, or whatever. There are people made in the image of God who are being exterminated. You say, so, so we come and we read Amos and we hear of the horrors and we go, oh, well, it's you know, Old Testament. Yeah, it was like weird times back then. No, folks, <laughs> this is humanity and it's unjust and it should be dealt with. And the promise of God is he, he sees and he will deal. So we pray for justice to be done, and we call out injustice where we find it. I'm not saying that every single one of us is going to be able to go advocate for every part. There's lots of injustice. So we can't, we, we can't chase down personally every single area of injustice that goes on in the world. But we can pray as we come across these things. And when we are, when, when we are face-to-face with injustice and have something we can do about it, we do something about it. And I don't stand here condescendingly going, you know, because I got this all figured out. I, not at all. But I don't want you to feel helpless either, and I want to give you just one example of how this plays out. Years ago, I don't remember which kid was in the hospital. It may have been when Claire. She spent about a few weeks in the hospital when she was a baby. Scary time, but, but I think it was maybe visiting her. I was leaving, and I went into a parking garage. I was leaving, going back to the car in a parking garage. And as I get to the top, I heard some commotion as I get to the top. I, I realize there's nobody else up on this top level of this parking garage except for a man and a woman, and he is verbally laying into her, and she is noticeably scared. I mean, it was not violent, but it was wrong, and I'm no hero, but I simply, <laughs> I had to say something, right? And so I, I called him out and told him he had to stop. Now, Again, I didn't have enough to say, hey, the police needed to be involved yet, but it was not okay. And again, who knows, there's, there's other times when maybe I miss stuff. What I'm saying is, folks, when we see stuff, when we see injustice, just as God pays attention to it, and just as God deals with it, we, too, should deal with it. That's what God expects of his people. And here's the deal. The gospel is good news. We don't earn God's favor. Full stop. Jesus has been perfectly just and righteous on our behalf. Which is why if you miss that opportunity, you can grieve. Hey, I, I didn't stand up for injustice. But we don't, we're not left going, and now I'm doomed. Because Jesus has been perfectly just and righteous on our behalf. But we deceive ourselves if we think that we have met the Lord, trusted him, and now are free to oppress the poor and crush the needy or to profit from those who do, knowingly profit from those who do. Know this, Jesus has come so that what he expects of his people can be possible through his people. He expects that we will care for others, but he's also given us another certain expectation. The expectation is this, we will be cared for. We will be cared for. Here's the thing. I respect your time. But I'm going to show you this video anyway. So, because um, <laughs> I think, I, I want you to see it. There's another clip from 
Chronicles of Narnia. Take a look. Eggman! Whoa, horsey! My name is Philip. Oh, sorry. The witch has demanded a meeting with Aslan. She's on her way here. You have a traitor in your midst, Aslan. His offense was not against you. Have you forgotten the laws upon which Narnia was built? Do not cite the deep magic to me, witch. I was there when it was written. Then you'll remember well that every traitor belongs to me. His blood is my property. Try and take him then. Do you really think that mere force will deny me my right? Little king. Aslan knows that unless I have blood as the law demands, all of Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. That boy will die on the stone table. As is tradition. You dare not refuse me. Enough. I shall talk with you alone. She has renounced her claim on the son of Adam's blood. Amos explains that on the day when Lord, the Lord's judgment comes, this will take place. Chapter 8, verse 9. In that day, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I will make the sun go down at noon. I will darken the land in the daytime. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will cause everyone to wear sackcloth and every head to be shaved. I will make that grief like mourning for an only son, and its outcome like a bitter day. What we saw there is the deal. Aslan strikes with the white witch. Her thinking that she's accomplished her goals him knowing there's something greater going on and also understanding what it would cost. 
And so we're told, when the days the Lord's judgment comes, there is mourning. But Amos isn't all doom and gloom. At the end of his book, of this book, this is what he tells us. In that day, I will restore the fallen shelter of David. I will repair its gaps, restore its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. This is the declaration of the Lord. He will do this. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When the plowman will overtake the reaper and the one who treads grapes the sower of seed, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and all the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and occupy ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink their wine, make gardens and eat their produce. I will plant them on their land and they will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them. The Lord your God has spoken. It's a vision of judgment. There's a vision of a new promised land. And with those two visions in mind, I want to take you back, last thing here, to the moments before or as Jesus was being arrested. An army came to arrest him, to take him away. And his followers, much like King Peter, took up arms to defend him. And Jesus responds in Matthew 26, 53 to 54. Do you think that I cannot call on my father? And he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels. How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus is referencing what C.S. Lewis calls the deep magic. He says, I could call on 12 legions of angels. You know a legion? How many soldiers are in a legion? 6,000. Jesus in that moment says, I could call on 72,000 angels, and that's really just a ballpark, right? I, can call, I mean, it's just to give you some sense. But I could, I could call down 72,000 angels to defend me right here and now, and these guys would know nothing about what just hit them. But that's not the way we're going to do this. Why? Why did Jesus take on the justice of God for you and I? He did it as a warning. Sin is no small thing. He is paying attention. And he will certainly deal with injustice. And he has very certain expectations for his people. The reason he didn't call down those angels and the reason he made sure that the scriptures were fulfilled was to welcome. Does he care? On the cross, he roared. Yes. Yes, he does. Let's pray. Father, would you allow your justice and your righteousness, your majesty to settle deep into our souls? God, wherever we are today, whatever the the morning's been, whatever the week has been, whether we're sitting here, some of us having trusted you and others having yet to bow the knee to their true king, Lord, whatever our situation, I pray that you would unsettle us in a certain respect with your majesty and yet grant us a peace unlike what we've ever known as we understand deeper and deeper what it means that you do indeed care for us. God, help us to not trifle with you, to not overlook our sin, to not think like, act like it, it has no bearing and it really doesn't matter. God, may we not be those people who think that you're sort of just, like Mr. Beaver said, an old geezer, sort of really not paying attention. Help us to understand you are paying attention to injustice and you will deal with it. And you have dealt with it. 
and we can be the recipients of your goodness. May we live out the expectations of your people. And may we live knowing that it is certain that you will care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
has shown great mercy to us. And we can run to him when we face trouble of all kinds. He is our refuge. Let's stand together. We'll sing our last song. Guys, before we leave, uh, a couple things. One, uh, many of you or some of you had wanted to come to the Quiet Time class. We're unable. Uh, we did this that pa- this past Wednesday, uh, but because some wanted to be there and couldn't make it, we're going to do it again. So I want to invite you if you want to come, uh, either learn hey, what's a quiet time or get some refresher on what's that involved. I think you'll enjoy the time. Uh, we had a good time on Wednesday night, so I want to invite you back this Wednesday, seven o'clock, and join me here in the building. Uh, with that, I want to pray together for the Uyghur Muslims. Join me, Father. We are your people, and we pray to our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, would you use those in power to expose the evil that is taking place in China? And God, would you deal with it? Swiftly, God, again, we can't get our arms around the magnitude of what we're hearing about. We understand it's not the only time in history when horrors have been done. But we want to see it stop, Lord. And we know your heart is for it to stop. We know you're powerful. We know you're mighty. We know that you are wise. So, Lord, would you work through authorities? Would you work in all the ways 
that you do indeed work. And spare these people and bring these perpetrators of evil to justice. We thank you that there's hope for sinners of all shapes and sizes. And we pray that you would help us to walk as your people, seeking justice and righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. May the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you now and until Jesus comes back. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time.